Happy fucking New Year and welcome back to Money Never Sleeps. Excited to be here with you today to start out a new year. The market's not doing too hot right off the bat. We'll be discussing that, what's coming in the weeks and months ahead, and our predictions for the year today on Money Never Sleeps. Thank you for being with us today and starting the year off on a high note. Before we get going, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Nothing that Kevin or I say is financial advice, so please do your own research before making any buys or sells, any FOMOs in or panics out, all of that good stuff. Kevin, Happy New Year, my man. It's good to catch up with you. We were off last week. Excited to be back into it this week. The market's not looking too hot as we begin jobs week. Uh, here in the uh, in the U.S., going to be a lot of economic data there. How are you feeling to kick off 2024? You're on mute, my dude. Happy New Year, everybody. Chris, thanks for being here as well. Happy New Year. Um, you know, appreciate you guys being here, and you know, I'm glad to be back, man. I'm very excited. Markets were absolutely boring. We knew that it was going to be boring into the last few weeks of the trading year. Is what it is. It's out of the way. But we did get a lot of information in those days where the market was up only that definitely kind of gave us a hint of what's happening in 2024. So first day of trading today, I'm ecstatic. You know, I'm glad to see the VIX moving a little bit here. We're starting to see a little bit of red pulling back. Like I was telling you before the show, nobody wanted to take any losses or capital gains in 2023. So it seems like they're going to be taking a little bit of that this year. At least they are starting the year off. Yes, sir. So let's kind of look at the week ahead we haven't entered earnings season yet, but we do have December economic data coming in. And this week, it's all about the labor market. Tomorrow, we get the JOLTS report, so the job openings. Expectations about 8.8 .8 million. We also get the minutes from the Fed's December meeting. And that's going to be really telling as far as the dot plot goes in regards to where the you know different Fed presidents see the rates going in the months ahead, you know, throughout the remainder of 2024. Then on Thursday, we get private sector employment data. And on Friday is the big jobs report. We'll find how many jobs were added in December, what the current unemployment rate is, hourly rate wages, all of that good stuff. So that is what we have looking forward to now. We'll get more inflation next week. The Fed has a meeting at the end of this month and then again in early March. Expectations continue to be and we're seeing more and more of it priced in that there are going to be Fed cuts possibly this month, that the rate could go down. We now see the market pricing in about an 11% chance that we see a 25 basis point cut. And for the month of March, we have it priced in that it's almost 80% probability that we see a you know a 25 to 50 basis point cut. So the markets are the markets are getting really, really ahead of themselves. I did a little bit of looking into you know different expectations from the experts out there, uh, those same experts who were kind of left with their dick in their hand and a lot of money on the sidelines throughout last year's rally of what they're expecting. And it's pretty bearish overall. You know, a lot of expectation that the recession will hit. The landing may not be as soft as the Fed and Janet Yellen are leading you to believe. But I'm curious, you know, we don't need to get into like full fledged predictions, but where is your attention in the next, let's say, four weeks? Yeah, man, I think there's a few things that are really important I, that we follow. Um, first off, just touching on what you said about potential rate cuts in January. If we did get a rate cut in January, something's terribly wrong. And the market might not be reacting to this maybe till a month or two later till we see something that actually comes to light. But that would be extremely bearish, worst case scenario if they started cutting in January. But, um, you know, that's going to be one thing we're going to keep an eye on. I think the other things that we need to keep an eye on are going to be in employment unemployment rate is going to be important um you know we saw that initial jobless claims came back uh, you know i think it was last week 218,000 uh so that was a tick up from previous we want to continue to see those move up if we think that there is going to be a recession coming in because the labor market is going to start leading up but the other thing is just going to be liquidity i think liquidity is going to be the most important thing um at least the first half of 2024 and then uh, definitely for the second half of 2024 as well probably as things get a little bit tighter but we're looking at the yield curve reinver reverting. You know, we're starting to see the two-year start to come down 
which means that people are definitely going to be putting their money into the longer term fixed uh, incomes for treasuries. You know, they're going to be the 10 year should be a higher yield than the two year. It hasn't been that way since the yield curve inverted. We're starting to see that tick back closer to zero. So once that goes positive, that's a pretty bearish sign once again. Um, you know, we've actually made some pretty good strides in the past few days, in the past few weeks, uh, getting it back to, you know, sub, I guess, north of negative 0.4. So we're at negative 0.35 right now. And the other stuff that's just, you know, important to keep an eye on is the reverse repo and the same thing with the bank term funding program. Because yes, we know that there's a lot of stuff going on on those fronts. And when it comes to liquidity, they're showing that there is definitely, uh, you know, whether it's collateral itself or just a necessary demand for US dollars, there's people that are trying to milk those, uh, those products that the Fed and, you know, the US government have to, at their, you know, I don't know what I was going to say. Their disposal. I was going to say exposal. And you can tell I'm not you know, still still got Listen, we're, we're, getting back, we're getting back into the rhythm. We're getting back into it. We're getting back into it. It's going to be okay. Exactly. exactly. So it's that's pretty much what I'm keeping an eye on. And the other thing, obviously, remains the issues outside the U.S. China is going to be my main concern, especially with Taiwan's elections this uh, this month. It's going to be a huge uh, thing to keep an eye on. I also think that's, you know, a lot of people are betting on China doing extremely well in 2024, which is a really weird thing for me to see because I think that we're seeing a synchronized global crisis where once one thing goes, I think everything's going to follow in suit. So I think there's a lot of things to be keeping an eye on, but the most important stuff is definitely going to come down to the liquidity and in those uh, institutions that I talked about that provide liquidity for the banks because the banks are most likely going to be at the center of all of this once again. Yeah, it's going to be, for me, looking at Q4 earnings that are going to kick off later this Good month. At the, at the end of the month, we're going to get Apple. And then in February, we're going to see some other you know, other big names in both tech and as well as retail and how they performed in Q4. Are we seeing spending decrease? Are we seeing people having to cut back more? What's going to be going on with student loans? All You, know, you talk about liquidity for the bank system, but also liquidity for consumers. And what what that is going to entail, you know, I saw a statistic that the the highest percentage of households own stocks ever. And, uh, you know, that maybe the timing of that isn't ideal. And that could be one way that people are just going to get absolutely crushed here. I hope that is not the case. But that is one thing I want to look for, you know, in the weeks ahead, you know, come to the last week of January and then through February. How do earnings look? Are these company, you know, also GDP? When we get the first reading for Q4 GDP later this month, we saw that the Q3 numbers were higher than expected, but each revision, they came down a little bit. What do we see with Q4? You know, we had this like four, I want to say the final number is like 4.7, 4.8 for Q3. No way Q4 is anywhere near that. And if we see it come in at like half a percent, how does the market respond there? Do we begin to see the cracks with commercial real estate later this year? Uh, I think the answer is, is yes. How does that impact the banks? How does that impact funding and liquidity? All of these things, the expectation that the election year is gonna fix everything, I think is a bit of a pipe dream. So yeah. we'll, see, we'll see what happens from that standpoint, but let's kind of get into what is going on today. And I mean, let's, let's start with tech getting absolutely crushed beginning the year down almost two percent apple uh down over four percent netflix 4.6 percent coinbase almost nine percent it is a bloodbath in tech right now i'm curious kevin if you have any feel for what is going on yeah definitely um i mean just looking at the apple i mean it's a pretty good indication of what we're seeing here and, and the reason i'm bringing up apple is because apple their market cap was absolutely insane. And we, we looked at this chart several times in the macro that Apple's value since COVID was just gone straight up. Like it's, it's absolutely insane. I mean, I can zoom out here and we can see that from the COVID drop back here, you know, when we were at $53 a share <laughs> guys are at $184 today. Um, but I think a lot of what we're seeing is new year uh, people taking profits because maybe their expectations are that things aren't going to be as great going into, you know, the rest of 2024. Um, you know, Apple already had a lot of issues in Q4 and we're starting to see that some of that price finally react to that. We know that they'd stopped selling the Apple watch due to some type of, uh, I think copyright issue with, whatever type of uh, technology that they use in the watch. We also saw that, you know, China kind of amped up their, their iPhone ban. So that definitely impacts, you know, Apple's, uh, 
you know, revenue. Um, but what we're seeing today, just if we're looking at this on a technical view, we got a double top. You know, we tried to break through this at one point. You know, we didn't do it. We went all the way down to, you know, October lows of this year or last year, I should say now. And then we came, we rallied all the way back, you know, in a matter of, you know, a month and a half. And we put in a little bit of a higher high. But for the most part, we could say that, yeah, even though we pushed up that high, we still closed relatively at the same level we did July 23's peak. So what we're seeing today is a pretty good gap down. We filled one of the gaps that was here to the upside that we failed to fill. We got a huge one right here. The question is, are we going to be able to fill that before we start to see the price continue to push down? I don't necessarily know. We have to see what the structure forms. I'm not uh, getting too ahead of myself here when I look at this, but if we look at you know some of the other stocks in uh, tech, we can see that we're still range bound in NVIDIA. You know, we didn't put in a higher high at all. Uh, at least in this chart, when we're looking at this, we were finding resistance around 503. Uh, we hit it, we put it, we went below it. We didn't get it, we didn't do it again back in uh, right at the beginning of or the end of the last year, the last trading days of last year. So we're probably going to be coming down to maybe fill some of these gaps that are down here. I think there's more than just that one, but you know, we're in this megaphone pattern at some point, it is going to break to one side or the other. I'll let you guys decide uh, which direction that goes. I'm not going to dog NVIDIA forever. Um, but I know that no, I, also, it, it sure as hell felt that way, Kevin. I was starting to take it a little personally. You probably should. No, I'm just saying the, that NVIDIA right now is very, it's very interesting because if we look at a lot of things that are going on in China right now, like I said, Taiwanese elections, I think that there's a good chance that there could be some, uh, some problems for them, you know, finding, revenue growing at that point, you know, there's going to be a lot of restrictions that the U S already placed on Nvidia selling to China. So it's going to be interesting to see what those Q4 or whatever Q earnings they do, because I know they have the weird type of schedule where it's like not the same fiscal year as a lot of other stocks, something to keep in mind. But um, what other was doing Meta's doing pretty bad today, right? It's doing, it's down about 2.9% down $10 or so a share. I mean, these are some pretty good uh, dumps on the first day of the year, right? Um, again, what has Meta done? Not, anything really i mean i can't tell you what you know meta's done i could say i could see nvidia price going up i could see apple's price going up meta for the most part i don't think they've necessarily had any product you also have to think about how much uh you know ad revenue they're making from their product too if people aren't advertising nearly as much that's going to impact their price same thing with google you know it's gonna be really interesting to see how tech plays out but i think a lot of people are starting to take profits because it's been a great year i mean i can't deny how great tech has done I just don't think that a lot of people are as bullish on the outlook for 2024 as maybe a lot of retail traders who have gotten in right at the end are probably hoping it will be that, you know, the soft landing is coming. So it's going to be really interesting. Q1 or, or Q4 earnings for, that we get in Q1 are going to be key, in my opinion. I also think that brick and mortar stores, too, just adding to that. I'm not saying short or anything like that, but those are the ones that I'm taking a look at and I'm probably going to decide whether I want to put any money in the market on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just seems like they're taking profit right now. And we had a, like I said, we had a great past month, two months in the market. It's been up only with no pullbacks kind of due for a correction. All right. Let's talk funding rates. Now I know that that was oh, yeah. another thing that you were very, uh, you were giddy like a schoolgirl to talk about funding rates today. So I'm going to let you go ahead and lead the charge there. I was a schoolgirl at one point. Just kidding. I was never a schoolgirl. But I will say this. The funding rates are fucked. Um, but they're not as bad as they were, right? Uh, last night, I think they were a lot worse. I saw Bitcoin close to like 9, I think it was like 8 or 9%. Uh, again, not 9%, but it'd be like 0 0.08, 0 0.09 around there. We can see that red is bad. That means people are going max long. And I say... That's bad because that tells me that there's a lot of people on the wrong side of a trade, right? Think about where Bitcoin's gone this year and why they're pricing this in. I think a lot of this is coming with the fact that they're hoping this ETF does come along in Q1 of this year. I mean, in some, this is what I think is going to probably going to happen. Either we're going to get the approval sooner than later, which means that, okay, this is probably getting the best thing for both bears and bulls because that gets this out of the way. We remember that there's six to nine months before a product is actually on the market for the ETF and people can actually buy it, trade it, do whatever they need to do. But the price isn't probably going to sustain that. We are expecting still about a 35 to 40% drop in Bitcoin, given what pre-having years have done and going into the having year, we expect that type of drop, right? When you see a trade this heavy on the, on the side, it's going to be really dangerous. Yep, here he is. ETF approval, huge spike and flash crash, in my opinion. I completely agree. I think that either we get the approval and we see that little quick spike up because people think, oh, this thing's going to the moon. 
then they probably just pull the rug in it because it's priced in at this point. Let's be honest. Uh, is it 100% funded, you know, one-to-one each coin? No, not at all. I don't believe that one bit, but I do think that there is a lot of money in there that has definitely pushed the price up in the past few months. That is definitely, uh, definitely pricing in the fact that this is going to be approved. Now, the question is, if it doesn't get approved, we know why. It's probably because a lot of the stablecoin issuers out there, uh, i.e., um, you know, USDT, FDUSD, TUSD, are it's things that are definitely keeping the SEC wary of, I guess, just afraid that they're going to do anything that's going to manipulate the price. It's like they've said you know, multiple times, USDT, BlackRock's even said that, uh, you know, USDT is very, uh, can manipulate the price easily. And they kind of are afraid of that going into this ETF approval. So that would be the reason we get rejected. But with everyone pricing this in and everyone seeing where the price of Bitcoin is, I mean, shout out to 45.5, even a little bit higher than that uh, today. The funding rates are so positive to the point where people are just on the wrong side of the trade. How much more room can you go up, right? In my opinion, when you see this this hard, this red across the board, everything positive, that tells me that we're probably going to see a flash crash at some point. We saw a little bit of a flash crash earlier today, shut down about $500. That's nothing crazy. But when I'm talking about a flash crash, I'm talking about us going below 40 k um, you know, maybe we could push up to 48k, but I think that if we do push up to 48k, that could be the ETF approval, wick up straight back down. I, I honestly believe that's what's probably going to happen. And you can see a lot of the Fugazi going on here where BNB is being max shorted. That tells me it's probably going to squeeze up one more time. And that's why it's green. And then you're probably going to see a lot of these other ones do a little flash crash. I think there's a lot of money circulating between these assets and they're just pushing the price up and artificially holding it up there. It's a lot of stuff we can get into when we look at some of the, some of these special coins, one being TRB, because that had an interesting, uh, close to the year but yeah I, I think these funding rates are very dangerous right here and it's the, it's the other thing too even if you know that it's going to probably tank at some point is it safe right now to be shorting this market i'm going to say no i think that there's a lot of danger out there in the crypto market and i'm not going to say that you can't but we know that there's a lot of exchanges out there that are you know use these usdt pairs and we know that a lot of this has to do with tether and some of these other uh, stablecoin issuers to the point where it's like even if you are right, the market does tank. Can you get out at a, at a value that is more than what you put in and make a profit? Can you get out can out any of your funds at all? That's those are things that you need to ask yourself because if it's not in USD and it's not in the United States for right now, saying pretty much Coinbase, I wouldn't be shorting anything right now. I think staying on the sidelines with cash couldn't be a better option for me personally because this is a dangerous game. And you know, just to get into it, let's take a look at TRB because. This is why I think that it's a bad idea to be short right now. And it sucks to say that because we're close to a top, right? But if we look at TRB and what's happened over the weekend, I mean, this is exactly why, you know, with leverage, you need to be careful. Look at this chart. That's a wick, guys. That's that's absolutely insane how much it shot up. It shot all the way up to, I think, 600, $620, dollars dude. Uh, let me pull up the five-minute chart on that for that day. Yeah, there we go. That's the five-minute chart for TRB. I was getting on a flight, and it was around four hundred and fifty dollars. Next thing I know, you know, I'm on the flight checking the Wi-Fi. Shit goes to six hundred like twenty-nine dollars, and then a few minutes later, all the way down at one hundred twenty-one. Was it? Did you see the one-month bond? Was it? A, did you see the? I did. I saw it live. That actually, was just, that was just a a glitch, right? Like it had to be. It wasn't. I it was. You know, that's someone moving out a lot of money. Okay. That's someone absolutely selling one month bonds. That's probably telling me that they're either moving liquidity into some other asset or they're probably buying tenure or anything that's going to give them a, a secure yield for maybe the next few years. Um, one month, 100%. Yeah, it did hit 6%. Let's take a look at that real quick just because it was, I saw it live. I saw it happen. I'm like, what the hell is it at 6% for? It was like, it was insane. I mean, because that was, that was today. Insane. Yeah. It happened uh, early this Late morning. Night. Early this yep. morning? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that is no glitch. That is someone opening money, you know, moving a lot of money around right at the open of the trading day. You can see right here, Monday, it opened. Tuesday, there it is. As soon as the Tuesday open happens, shoots all the way up. Now it wakes all the way back it's down. It's not even showing up on the hourly, which is, the, which is why I thought it was a glitch. Like, I'm not seeing. It's right there. It's a little dot. Let me see if I can. Right there. Oh, now I see it. Okay. Yeah. So that was as soon as the market opened, someone had that order. That there. was yesterday. That was yesterday. Uh, yesterday afternoon. In, 
The same uh, showing on my chart is showing Monday at seventeen hundred. I got Tuesday right at market open. Yeah, that's uh that's today. That happened. This is on the one hourly chart. So this what the hell? I pressed the wrong button. Guys, I haven't opened trading view in a week. You can tell that I'm 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 a little bit uh rusty, little but here. Rusty. Yeah, this is this is today. This is uh zero, zero hundred hours. So that was right as the market opened for the bond market, and they just absolutely dumped the shit out of the one month treasuries. A lot of people are saying that's a glitch. Well, if that's a glitch, then we're seeing that across a lot of the global bond markets because we saw that a lot for the shorter term yields. Eventually those are going to go down. Those are going to go down significantly. Right. But for right now, we're starting to see maybe some of that movie movie, some of that money <laughs> move into some of the other uh, yields. And you can see that, you know, some of these yields are up a little bit today, maybe dumping a little bit, but the important thing that we want to see is the 10 years yield being higher than that of the two year. If the two year continues to go down, that eventually leads us to what's important, which is this reversion, right? And this is what I was talking about in the beginning of the show. This is where we were, you know, February, I don't know, Friday, December 15th or so. And this is around the time that the Fed was starting to talk about pivots and look how much we've already reverted at this point. So the longer that the 10 years yield is higher than the two year, the quicker we are going to push up towards the zero. And once again, when we talk about what happens when we get back to the above zero after being inverted for such a period of time, we tend to see, I got to go to the, I got to go to the weekly to see this one, you know, in, in due course, we end up getting into a recession and, you know, the recession from, 20 2006 2007 you know materialized in 2007 after reverting back in early 2007 um you know same thing back here in 2001 you know by february 2001 you know it was only a few few weeks before we were in a recession back in for the dot-com bubble so seeing that reversion is definitely going to be a bad sign if you are bullish on the market but this is the one thing I think that in Q1 we are going to see. And I think it's possible that we could see that reversion at some point as early as mid to late February. And uh, that would be a terrible sign for the market. But it's very possible that that gets there, you know, especially if the markets continue dumping and these yields are where people start moving their money into. Pretty good chance that we're going to start seeing that two-year yield, that uh, value drop significantly as people try and lock up some secure gains for 2024, maybe even 2025. All right. We're, begin we're getting near the end of our show today. Give me a couple charts you want to look at, and then we will wrap it up. Absolutely. I think we just got to stick to the important ones. We'll take a look at – let's take a look at gold real quick. Now, a lot of people are saying that gold is the hedge against everything that's coming, and they're right, but I don't think that they're right right now. Uh, that might be a controversial thing to say, but when I look at the gold chart, I've, I'm – convinced that we are due for a bit of a correction in gold we had this you know massive abc corrective pattern that we've put in since you know september october of 2022 a wave there in may of 2023 around the banking crisis again that was a period of uncertainty so the gold obviously pushed up down in the summer as equities kind of rallied um you know to july and then eventually you know it started going up again once equity started rallying again, which is really interesting. So that makes me think that it just is an ABC corrective pattern after you know this five-way move, but it's a pretty good move to the upside. Now, what I'm seeing is we're still in a parallel channel. I think we got another, we're waiting for a wave three to the downside, right? We've had a, we wicked up here real quick and we came all the way back down to about 1975, bounced and got our head hit off of the 2086 level. It's a little bit north of 2083, which was the level that we had talked about. And now we're looking for a retest of this line down here. Now the question is, does it hold? I don't necessarily know if it's going to hold. I think we have a good chance we could break below it. And maybe the retest doesn't get through. And then we have to go down a little bit lower. So when I'm looking at this right now, I think that we're probably probably in a five-way move to the downside and wave three could take us, you know, I think it's definitely gonna take us south of 1900. It could even take us, you know, south of 1875. We could have a pretty good move to the downside for gold. And I think that gold is definitely going to pick up as some of the market does finally start to dip. And then we start to realize that there is a big crisis on our hands, if that's the case, but with gold going down, I think that's going to create the case for a stronger dollar. And I mean, if we're looking at this today, it looks like the dollar is having a pretty good day, given that gold is going down a little bit here and also the markets are selling off. So we can see that cash is still important in the market, even if it is at these levels down here. I think a lot of people are max short on the dollar. I think that's a good chance for a bit of a squeeze in the DXY. Now the question is, will it be accelerated come March? And I think that the banks are probably going to start to see a lot of pain. I think the banks are 
probably going to start to see the beginning of a lot of bank collapses after maybe March 15th or so. And I say that just because that's after the programs and everything run out. I think the dollar is going to take off like crazy. And then, you know, the I think the gold trade is probably going to sell off a little bit there until people realize that, okay, we're in a financial crisis and then maybe gold will take off from there. But it's just not today. I don't think that gold is going to go to all time highs from where it currently is. I think we got a bit of a correction going down first. Um, Looking into some of the other things we were talking about before the break, real quick, the Russell, you know, we said that we were probably going to put in a, a new high. We did. We put in a new high at around 2072. And now it looks like we're filling this major gap to the downside here where it's, well, it's not necessarily a gap. It's just kind of been a rejection zone for the market. But we're going down a good amount. We got a pretty good gap here between 1965 and 1947. So I think that what this is, when we zoom out, is nothing more than an ABC corrective pattern. And we finished the B wave, I think there's a good chance that if this corrective pattern right here and this WXYXZ is done, it's a good chance that we are on our way down to hopefully bottom out the Russell. And this is just the beginning of that major C wave of that larger correction. So with earnings coming out, I think this is definitely going to give us a sign of whether this the direction of the Russell is to the upside or to the downside. Uh, what else? Let's go into Bitcoin real quick. We can see what Bitcoin's doing right here. Um, you know, this level of 45,596 up here is extremely important. It's a pretty good level of resistance. We went to it and then got rejected right off of it. it. Looks like the daily stochastic RSI is going up pretty fast. I wouldn't be surprised if we get to a point where it does dump a little bit before it goes up, maybe anymore. It really depends on the news of the ETF at this point and what the exchanges are doing. But I think there's a level up here that we have to keep an eye on, and that is around 48263. 48. It's the green line there. I think it's possible that we could push up a little bit higher, making the C wave extended. I mean, if that's the case, then you know that could be the top of the market. And I think that any rejection from that line there is a pretty good sign that maybe there is a lot of room to the downside for Bitcoin. And if that's the case, I'm the least targeting, and I know this is a very controversial thing to say. I'm still targeting, you know, sub FTX lows. Um, if you think about this in the, um, in wave structures, this is no different than where we were back here, back in September, October of uh, 2021. And eventually, you know, we saw what happened when that, that five wave move came to the downside. This is just a corrective pattern here. I think there's a good chance that we could be putting another five waves down. Could it take us a lot lower? It really depends on both Bitcoin, crypto, you know, what happens with the ETF, but more importantly, liquidity in the entirety of global markets. It's a good chance that this could go a lot deeper than people probably anticipate. You know, I still got my targets around nine, uh, 9,750. I think that's a level that might get wicked down to, but you know, between 13, 14 K and, you know, maybe 10 K or so, I think there's a good chance that we could fill that range and put in a lower low, um, at least this cycle. So I'm very, very much watching how Bitcoin reacts up here because I don't necessarily think that there is enough powder unless the exchanges are doing something crazy that's going to push the price up. I think that a lot of the market is priced in. We're starting off 2024 very strong with Bitcoin's price, right? It went up only since the beginning of the year. It's only been two days. So I wouldn't be uh, getting too excited about Bitcoin's price. Same thing goes for a lot of these other coins, right? We're talking about Binance. I think this one's got a bit of a uh, push to the upside, even if I look at this here. This is a parallel channel. It's probably going to break to the upside here. Where could this take us? Three, uh, 350. I mean, it could even take us up to about 362. So there's still a bit of a room to the upside, I think, for BNB. And if I'm looking at this as a five-wave move, say wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and then wave five, maybe a bit of a blow-off top. Now, imagine if that went to all-time highs. I'm not saying it will, but could you imagine, given what's happened with TRB, which is a Binance coin? Anything is possible right now. That's why I say it's very dangerous in this market to be shorting anything um, across the board. Looking at anything else, I mean, let's just talk about Solana, right? I think a lot of people are bullish on Solana. They think this thing's going to take off. We have to remember what's going on with Solana. A lot of people have exposure to it. It's the wrong people in the crypto market that have exposure to it. That's one thing that needs to be said because this thing shot up from $22 to all the way to $126 in a given period of time. If they can get out for a majority of their stake north of here, well, let's double the amount that it was when FTX collapsed. So you really have to start keeping an eye on stuff like that. We even saw a really good rejection back uh, a few days back when it shot up to 126, almost 127, and we went as low as $97. So, I mean, even looking at that, that's a pretty good move to the downside. You know, that's 22% move in a matter of days. So, yes, it's an extremely volatile market, but 
if you were looking at this, this is an extremely overextended pattern. Everything in crypto is pretty overextended. I'm seeing exchange tokens. Even this one today, KuCoin, someone moved a hundred and something million dollars worth of KCS coin. Why are they moving that? Probably because it's a lot of people very similar to Binance and FTX and Solana that have exposure to it. They probably want to get out at a good level, considering that it's now up here when it was all the way down here at $3.46. So I think that we're still in a very fraudulent market. You need to be keeping in a way, uh, keeping an eye on a lot of things that are happening. So stay vigilant. Uh, I'm just, I'm remaining doing less right now. I'm just watching the markets. I think I made most of my plays last year. And I'm just kind of sitting in them confidently and every day just look to see if anything changes. But for the most part, it looks like things are lining up for what we've been saying for a long time. You just got to be patient and wait for it to actually uh, come to fruition. Patience and constant vigilance. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for today. Appreciate you joining us. We'll be back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, going over the latest jolts data, anything else that is moving the markets. If you have not yet, do us a solid. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment, share us out on social. Anything you can is greatly appreciated helping us grow this bad boy. Have an awesome rest of your day. Stay safe out there. It's going to be a good week. It's going to be a good month. It's going to be a good year. By hook or by crook, we're going to make it happen. Appreciate you all. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Stay that cash. Take care, everyone.